Welcome to Logan Canyon. Driving east out of Logan, Utah on Highway 89, we shortly encounter the mouth of the canyon. Today our destination is the T.W. Daniel Experimental Forest, about 45 miles up the canyon. In the lower part of the canyon, we will pass a series of three dams built on the scenic Logan River. Down at this elevation, vegetation in Logan Canyon on the south-facing slopes is dominated by Utah juniper and deciduous woodland. However, if we will look southward at the north and east-facing slopes of Mill Hollow and Spring Hollow, we notice a vast sea of Douglas fir. The large cliffs hint at the area's unique geology, which is dolostone. This Silurian-aged sea bottom is magnesium-rich and results in good soils. Beautiful scenes like this are common in Logan Canyon. Also common is the presence of a wide array of wildlife. The combination of even aged Douglas fir and Mormon settler place names should leave little to the imagination about the early logging in the canyon. The cliffy topography is also home to ancient trees, such as this 1,000 year old Rocky Mountain juniper. and most notably the 2,000-year-old Jardine juniper, discovered in the 1920s by some Utah State Agricultural College students. At this point we are climbing an elevation and we start to see stands of quaking aspen as a component in the landscape. of the upper Logan River Valley from Tony Grove shows just how heterogeneous the vegetation mosaic is in the canyon. Looking across the valley more closely at the high elevation south facing slopes, one can see large stands of pure curl leaf mountain mahogany, common here and important to wildlife in the wintertime. Higher in the canyon, aspen becomes a dominant cover type. Standing at the site of the 1890 Kondike Mill, more even-aged Douglas fir is evident. Beaver Mountain on the left is our local ski spot, and if you scan just below the horizon, you can see the recent fire scar from 2016. Here, a closer look at the fire just north of Beaver Mountain. By this point in the drive, the karst topography associated with the Dolostone geology should be apparent and is also associated with the name of this valley, the Sinks. As we approach Bear Lake Summit, the turnoff for the Sinks Road, Forest Road 55, is on the south side. At this point, it is only about four miles into the T.W. Daniel Experimental Forest, four sections of forest land operated in cooperation with the Forest Service. originally called the school forest, and then the college forest, and finally, in 1995, 
named in honor of Theodore Doc Daniel as the T.W. Daniel Experimental Forest. The first stop on our way into the forest is this 170-year-old, even-age lodgepole pine stand. You'll notice a lot of areas on the forest, primarily dominated by lodgepole pine, but including other species as well, that are of the same age class, all regenerated after a large stand-replacing fire complex in the extreme drought year of 1847. We have a couple lines of evidence indicating the exact origin of these stands. Plenty of charcoal on the site hints at a fire history but there are even more exact ways to determine the fire dates. Fire scars, and there were plenty of those here as well. Previous research on this site used a combination of increment cores and fire scars to pinpoint the large fire to 1847, and a number of other smaller, lower severity fires at the turn of the 20th century. Those will come into play in a later video. While there are other species in the overstory, like this Douglas fir, these stands are clearly dominated by lodgepole pine, which is primarily non serotonous on this site. As you can see, this stand is extremely dense. Currently, stand density index is well over 60% of maximum, and the quadratic mean diameter is about 10 inches. This stand is well into stage E of stand development, indicated by substantial subalpine fir in the understory. Site so index in this stand is about 85 feet, base age 100. And this stand has developed more or less naturally over the last 170 years. In its current state, this lodgepole pine is highly susceptible to mountain pine beetle and has the potential for crowning fire behavior. As you can see, endemic populations of the mountain pine beetle are already at work in this stand. even aged stands of lodgepole pine of this age are increasingly susceptible to wind throw, which in the absence of stand replacing disturbances will help shift these stands toward the spruce fir forest type. As you can see across the old road here in the stand there is no short of advance of advanced regeneration, mostly subalpine fir, but also some Engelmann spruce, just waiting to make its way to the canopy. All throughout these stands, and others on the experimental forest, are hints of the ongoing research, including monitoring of the bark beetle pressure. And of course, there has been a long history of teaching in these stands as well. The second stop on the tour of the experimental forest is the Little Bear Clear Cut in the Cheney Creek drainage. This was conducted in the late 1970s and had the express goal of regenerating lodgepole pine. This 1980s air photo shows two of the stands involved in the clear cut. If you look closely, you can also see the fingerprint of some experimental thinning trials that we will discuss shortly. The clear cut was conducted in mature lodgepole pine that originated in the same 1847 fire that was mentioned in the first video, indicated by the arrow. As you can see, the clear cut achieved its goal. The current day stand, now over 40 years old, is almost ready for its first commercial thin. This is only possible because the stand was operationally pre-commercially thinned in the late 1980s. The thinning trials I mentioned earlier were conducted in the early 1980s and while they got overrun during the operational thin, their presence is still noticeable into the, in the stand into the late 1990s when this photo was taken. One of the features still noticeable today 
is the small area of the stand that did not get pre-commercially thinned. It is fantastically dense, which meant it was excellent snowshoe hare habitat early in stand development. While there is still evidence of hair in these stands today, the crowns of these densely packed trees have lifted, and the hair have moved into other areas of the stand and forest. These yellow rebar posts indicate long-term monitoring for the snowshoe hare, but as you can see, these once young stands are turning into a respectable forest. Full utilization of the site is apparent by the lack of the understory throughout most of the stand. As these thinned trees continue to grow in height, they will start to differentiate into crown classes. Here is a portion of the stand that did not get pre-commercially thinned, and also has a large component of aspen. A small part of the Little Bear clear cut type shifted to aspen. In an associated 360 video, I help to explain why. Although not prevalent, porcupines are also fond of these young lodgepole pine stands. Now we're at the edge of the Little Bear stand, where it butts up against its late 1980s counterpart, the Mine Got stand. This was a shelter wood with reserves in the same forest type, and will be the subject of the next video on the T.W. Daniel Experimental Forest. The third stop on our tour of the T.W. Daniel Experimental Forest is the Mine Got Stand, just uphill and adjacent to the Little Bear Clear Cut. This treatment was conducted about 15 years after the Little Bear Clear Cut. Take note of the substantial variability and regeneration along with the vertical structure associated with the residual trees. One goal of the Shelterwood with Reserves was to increase species diversity. As you can see, in addition to lodgepole pine, there are substantial aspen and subalpine fir. The primary goal of this treatment was to regenerate lodgepole pine, but with the experience of Little Bear and associated pre-commercial thinning costs, a shelter wood with reserves was implemented in an attempt to tone down the amount of regeneration. That was successful in most areas of the stand combination of strip and uniform shelter words was conducted, and you can see the differences between these two in the associated 360 videos. The two little bare patches have quite homogeneous regeneration, whereas in contrast, the area inside the manga unit is much more heterogeneous. And like Little Bear, the lodgepole regeneration was wildly successful in this non serotonous population. But unlike Little Bear, no subsequent pre-commercial thinning was conducted. There are portions of the stem that are still very dense, but portions that are not. At the time this harvest was conducted, the forest was without a timber cell administrator, and the amount of residual damage was substantial. By definition, 
Reserves were never removed, and many have blown down, which was anticipated initially in planning. Also, because of its absence on the site, Engelman Spruce Enrichment Planning was part of the original prescription and was conducted the year after the harvest. Nearly 40 years later, the effect of the shelter wood with reserves is that there is substantial spatial variability in structure and compositional diversity. And like the Little Bear clear cut, the Mayangot stand was great snowshoe hare habitat, but canopies in the dense portions of the stand have lifted out of reach of the bunnies. Please take a few moments to go and view the associated 360 videos for this stand. The fourth stop on the tour of the T.W. Daniel Experimental Forest is the Goshawk stand, called that because it has been home to nesting goshawks. You can see the plot center stake we use for forestry educational activities in this stand. There's a reason we spend a lot of time here. This stand shares an interesting history with the first stop on the tour, the 170 year old Lodgepole Pine stand, which is now a couple miles down the road. They both originated from the same 1847 fire complex. However, the Gossock stand was also subject to a lower severity fires in 1903 that only acted to thin some of the stand. We know this from excellent previous work that dated stand origin and fire scars. Evidence of this research can be found all over the forest. The result of subsequent non-stand replacing fires, that there are fewer trees per acre of larger individual tree size than in the comparison stand. There are also large open groups throughout the stand. The combination of open areas situated next to live trees with larger lower branches comprises perfect habitat conditions for goshawks. Goshawks prefer to build their nests in closed canopy forests, but that are adjacent to, lar adjacent to large openings for foraging. The goshawks like to build nests in trees that still have intact canopies above the nest. This is to protect their young from depredation by other raptors. The fire scars remind us that mixed severity fire regimes and not just stand replacing fires can be part of these montane lodgepole pine systems. The fifth and final stop on the tour of the T.W. Daniel Experimental Forest is a unique area of high elevation spruce fir. Just a small section of the forest above about 8,500 feet in elevation. While well, the spruce fir in the Daniel Forest is just up the road from the Goshawk stand, the disturbance history on this higher elevation Masic site is different, likely originating over 250 to 300 years ago. It is likely that the stand originated after a large fire that had heterogeneous effects on post-fire conditions, not unlike this 1980s fire scar just west of the stand. Composition in the spruce fir forest type includes Engelmann spruce, subalpine fir, and curiously aspen as old as 300 years, likely part of the original post-fire cohort. There are also trace components of Douglas fir, lodgepole pine, and lumber pine. The density in this stand is well over 200 square feet per acre, and the dominance by spruce indicates its late secessional status. In stands of this age, there is an abundance of standing dead trees, such as this aspen stem. There is also evidence of disturbance agents that take advantage of these large trees and dense stands, such as these spruce beetle killed spruce.
The death of these individual trees, or small groups of trees, likely drives regeneration dynamics in the absence of larger scale disturbances. The growing space these killed trees opens is small, but perfect for perpetuating Engelmann spruce and subalpine fir. Another feature of these old forests is the massive amount of coarse woody debris, an issue to consider if designing treatments in these stands. As you can see, there is no shortage of advanced regeneration in the understory of these spruce fir forests. In some cases, these understory spruce and fir can be in excess of 200 years old, having established closer to the original overstory cohort, but losing the race to the canopy. This blown over spruce tip up mound created a large pile of mineral soil. And of course, this mineral soil is exactly what regenerating spruce needs to establish. The other thing this advanced regeneration needs to succeed are canopy gaps. Such as this one. In spruce forests this old and this dense, some risk factors are concerning, in particular the spruce beetle. Endemic populations of these beetles find their home in these forests, but it would be a shame if they were to build to epidemic levels. On this spruce fir forest in particular, the spruce beetle was one of the driving factors that was considered when assessing these stands for their desired silvicultural treatments. To get an idea of just how dense these stands are, take a look at the associated 360 video that I created here. And once you've had a chance to do that, follow me, and we'll head over to the treated portion of the spruce fir stand to talk about silviculture. As part of the fifth stop on the Daniel Forest, we are going to work our way through the X4 timber cell, starting here in one of the landings which is full of planted spruce. The goal of these treatments was threefold, regenerate spruce, reduce spruce beetle hazard, and demonstrate three silvicultural systems in spruce. In this video pan from the landing, I am showing just a cursory look. First at the individual tree selection, then the group selection, and then the shelter wood with reserves treatments. The individual tree selection system is based on a maximum diameter of 24 inches, a cutting cycle of 20 years for 120 year rotation, and a residual stocking of 33% of maximum SDI, which is about 200. Because the entire stand was treated in the individual tree selection method, there was no reason to treat the matrix. As you can see, there's substantial structural variability associated with this treatment. There is also an abundance of advanced regeneration and also some natural regeneration that has occurred as well. Group. Now we are looking at the one at one of the quarter acre groups created as part of the group selection Quarter's system. Opening. In this treatment, the cutting cycle was also 20 years. And because this was the first entry, the matrix was thinned to about 120 square feet. As you can see, spruce beetle was and still is a problem in these stands. Third treatment is unconventional for spruce fir, a shelter wood with reserves. This treatment was designed to demonstrate a viable alternative to uneven aged approaches that could treat the entire stand in one entry, more rapidly decreasing the spruce beetle hazard. The reserves were characterized as having a QMD of about 26 inches, which is 30 trees per acre, and a residual basal area of about 60 square feet. Not only did the shelter wood treat the entire stand, but the visual effect is also nice.
Wind throw was one of the major concerns when lowering the density to 60 square feet in spruce, and while there has been some in the 15 years since treatment, it has not been substantial. Of course, Winthrow and spruce are excellent habitat for spruce beetle, which, one of the, which is one of the reasons they are of concern. One of the considerations for both the group selection and the shelter wood was the presence of absence on the site, of aspen on the site. In some cases, the openings promoted the aspen as opposed to spruce. Because this spruce fir stand had never been entered commercially, there were substantial large mature trees that were removed as part of the prescription. Notice the sunglasses for scale. Also part of the prescription for the shelterwood and group selection units was post-harvest planting of 2O Engelmann spruce containerized seedlings to ensure successful regeneration. And because both the individual tree and group selection units will be re-entered on a 20-year cycle, we have the opportunity to remove decadent and low vigor trees such as these to improve stand quality over time. But we still have the opportunity to retain or promote desirable characteristics of the stand, like these old aspen trees for non-timber objectives. As always, you can find 360 videos for all three treatments. Thank you for joining us on the tour.